Hello, it's Mother Willow Moon, and I'm back with our next video in our Year in a Day series here on the Family Wicca. Today we're going to talk about the history of witchcraft. Now, the history of witchcraft could be a whole class all by itself. There are a million books written on the history of witchcraft. Everyone has their own point of view and their own ideas of what actually happened and what went down. But I'm going to just stick to a few of the basic topics because the point is to express to you that we have been around since the dawn of man. We've just had some issues in between there, which has forced us to do certain things like go underground for a while. But witchcraft has been alive and kicking for a long time. So we're going to go over these different topics, these different time periods, so that you can see what we were doing around those time periods and to help you formulate how Wicca could possibly be old and new. Not very many people can say their religion is both old and new, but we can actually say that because it's the truth. So let's go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover and I'm going to wrap this up by giving you some foundational authors that I believe are excellent for just starting out or refreshing your idea of what's happening in Wicca itself. So we're going to go back to the Paleolithic era. This is way, way far back there. But the thing is, is that there is cave art that we can look at from that time period that shows us forms of sympathetic magic being performed by the Aboriginal tribes. Now, I have a, a picture on our week two um, year in a day page that you can look at, and that is depicting a particular cave art in France. And if you look down at it, down towards the bottom, and then close, go up just a little bit, you will see a man. And this man is dressed in animal skin, and he's holding a bow. He's standing in the middle of all of his prey, and he has a plethora of, play, of prey for him to choose from. It's not like he has one little deer. He has lots of different things that he can choose from. What is happening here is called sympathetic magic. You see, sympathetic magic is where we act out by either dance, acting, poetry, song, visualization, or even a book or a literary piece, what we want to see and how we want to see it come to fruition. What they're doing in this particular cave art is they're showing that they would do a particular ritual dance and a acting out of capturing their prey. You see, meat was very important. It was something that sustained them through the winter. So they wanted and needed a successful hunt and that's why our God is the horned God because it was the God of the hunt the provider of the meat the protein that would carry them on and the fat that would carry them through the winter so that they could stay warm and full back then death was a real issue in the winter time people would die of illness starvation and even from being really cold. So they had these different things that they would perform to ensure that their hunters would be able to gather up enough meat for their villages to last them through the winter. Now, you will see these on videos everywhere where they, they don the, the animal skins and they put on the, the antlers of the animals and they have their tools of hunt and they dance around and someone would pretend like they're the prey and someone else would pretend like they were the hunter and they would act out shooting their prey and the prey would fall to the ground and they would dance and celebrate and everybody would hoop and holler because they were successful and they would take that prey back and present it to the chief of their tribe and and show that they were going to be successful and the more more successful the man was at hunting the greater he was for his community so it showed his prestige and his victory and he believed that that's what was going to happen and then they began to draw it on the walls and so you see all this artwork of them successfully getting all the things they needed to carry them through the winter well, this carries on for a very long time. Sympathetic magic is actually still used today. We will reenact certain events in Wiccan history. We 
We'll reenact things that we want to see come to fruition, like finding our true love or or being successful in our endeavors, you know, whatever the case may be, it still happens today. People write beautiful poetry, people write lovely songs. You see sympathetic magic moving without it even being recognized as what it is. And today, as witches, we still will utilize those tools so that we can visualize ourselves completely and successfully going and reaching our mark, whatever our goal is. Today we're mostly about the mind, so we use a lot of visualization to see ourselves successfully moving down the path and arriving at the destination that we have des that we desire to get to. That's why witches are so good at getting the things they want because they see it happen first. They believe it's going to happen and then they make it happen. So, it's a very important part of our manifestation triad of see, believe, and achieve. Now, once you jump ahead just a little bit, remember we have to move forward through this history pretty quick, you're going to come to 50 to 150 AD. Now during this time, the Bible is being compiled. Constantine is in the lead. He has said we need a cohesive book of religious beliefs that we can all stand on. Because if we are scattered like all the books are, because there were many books that are not in the Bible that were out at the time. If we're scattered like that, we will not survive as a religion. We need a foundation, a firm foundation. And so they sat down and began this act of compiling the books of the Bible. Now these men chose these specific books because they believed that they were the Word of God. In these books you will see magic everywhere. It is a foot throughout the whole entire Bible. I know because I've read it several times. So you see Moses acting on magic. He goes before the Pharaoh and his, his mystics are there. They throw down their staff and it turns into a snake guess what? Moses turns around and does the same thing. And he was directed by God to do so. Of course, they go back and forth and he, his snake eats their snake and shows he's more powerful. And it just is a continuation of these magical acts between them to show that God is just as powerful as the mystics. His God is just as real. So there you see it right there. Then you also see it where they go to mediums and they contact the dead, like when Saul is contacting Samuel, wanting to know, you know, is God ever going to find favor with me? He contacts a medium and brings up the spirit of Samuel. Then if you move into even their New Testament, you will see Jesus performing magical acts. They call them miracles. Magic is magic to me. He even endorsed it saying that if you look at this mountain and tell it to move, It'll move. You will do greater things than you've seen me do. And he turned water to wine, walked on water, fed thousands of people with very little food. He was able to take places where they weren't catching any fish and make so much fish that the, the boats would almost tip, do, tip over. He was very magical. He even performed the ultimate magic, which was bringing the dead back to life. And he did that for his friend Lazarus. So you will see magic all throughout this Bible. And it even refers to witches and witchcraft in particular in the Bible. So you know that when these men compiled the Bible, they knew exactly who we were. And they believed that that was still the infallible, meaning perfect, word of God. So there you see us live and kicking. So now let's go ahead and we're going to jump again. This time we're going to kind of jump to 1232 because that's when the first papal against witchcraft in particular was released by the church saying witches are going to burn. The thing is, is that at that particular time, the Christians were wanting to convert for whatever reason, some of them for very good reason. They wanted all their family to be with them in heaven. They didn't want them to be tools of Satan. So for whatever reason, they began to create sites over pagan sites. And what they were hoping was that the pagans would come here for their rituals and would come here for their, their gatherings and they would see these, these new erected buildings or temples and participate with the Christians that were there, showing them that Christianity is not so different, yet completely different, from witchcraft. 
Well, unfortunately, this didn't work very well because the witches did not buy it. And so when the peasants and the pagans, the pagans being the people who lived on the outlying areas of the cities, they were your country folk, they actually farmed the land, lived on the land, ate off the land. They knew nature inside and out. And when they had a question, they turned to the witches because witches would help them heal their crops, heal their animals, and even heal their bodies. They were great healers. And they were people who had a lot of wisdom, and they brought the community together. They were teachers and communicators, and they were the educators. So they were the people that they would turn to. Well, this upset the church. What made it even worse is that the witches weren't even the spiritual group. They were spiritual, but not even as much as the people they turned to, which were the Druids. So they lumped the Druids in with the, Christ with the Wiccans, and now this group has a papal release saying that they are no longer allowed by law to practice their faith. At first, witches are like, you can't make that law. How are you going to enforce that law? Well, they do. It's hard, but they do it. They do. It is so hard, in fact, to get them to stop and to get them to allow these pagans to, you know, they weren't allowing them. They just would not speak on the behalf of nature. They would just keep to themselves. But before that, they had a hard time getting them to do that. So they decided, well, discipline. That's the way to get them to do it. So the Malus Maleficarum comes into play. That comes into play in 1486 when Kramer and Springer, two German monks, write this book called the Malus Maleficarum. It's the witch's hammer, the hammer of the witches, the hammer to hammer out witchcraft. They want to get rid of it and stomp it out of the cities. These people are on the hunt, and they're on the hunt for witches. If that doesn't tell you how powerful we are and how much we influenced the day and that time, I don't know what else will. But for a long time, this book was printed over and over again. It didn't. Its final print was in 1669. So this is 183 years of the book just being in print that these German monks were allowed to run amok and use this book as the textbook for hunting witches. And then they would take that same book into the courts and utilize it to prosecute them. They would take witches and drown them. They would say if they didn't drown, they were a witch, and they would hang and burn them. And if they did drown, well, they weren't a witch, but oh well, God will forgive their soul for even appearing to be so, and they would move on. So either way, witch was dying. The sad part is, it wasn't even witches that were dying. It was their own people, their Christian converts, that were being accused of these things and then had no defense for themselves. That's why I like to say with, that Christians should have a bumper sticker that reads, The Burning Times, no more, <laughs> because they died more than we did. <laughs> we got smart, and we went underground. We hid away because we knew that there was no way to win. They outnumbered us. Their sheer numbers were more than we were, not to mention we are not an aggressive people. We will protect ourselves, but we will not go out and in search of a battle or a fight. Now, we could, but we were, we were spread so far and wide. We weren't all together, and we weren't able to protect ourselves. We only were in small cities and covens that we had lived in all of our lives. There was no need for us to worry about the protection of us and our families. But it happened, and these men were in the lead, making sure that all of us paid the price for being witches. Unfortunately, as I said, most of the time it wasn't even a witch. There were witches, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't always. Well, this led us to stop helping, stop guiding, stop sharing. We stuck to family units, and that's how the form of hereditary witchcraft was born. It was born because the only people you could trust, and even then it was iffy, was your family. So it stayed within the family units. We went underground and did not come back. We stayed to ourselves. We couldn't come back if we wanted to because that law stayed in place until 1951. In 1951, the last repeal against witchcraft was enacted, meaning now we can openly practice witchcraft. But after 700 years of religious genocide, 
There wasn't many of us willing to walk out in the sh out into the sunlight and say, "Here we are. We're so glad to be alive again. Let's throw a Sabbath celebration." <laughs> More than likely, that wasn't going to happen. They were going to keep to themselves because they were like, oh no, we've learned our lesson. And unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church is running the cities all over Europe. So we do not want to be a part of that. We're going to stick to ourselves. And they did. Actually, the only reason that it even was brought to light was because of a man named Gerald Gardner. You see, Gerald Gardner was a wealthy man. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because the role he plays in witchcraft is important. But I want you to understand its place within the history of witchcraft in general. Now this wealthy man, Gerald Gardner, he actually was a foreman on plantations that his family would send him to to improve his skills. Back then you didn't really have a lot of colleges where you tried to get in and yeah, you're that's how it worked. Usually you worked under people who were good at what they did. And he went and worked on plantations to learn how to run them. Not necessarily to get out and work the fields, but to run the people who did run the fields. So he went all these different places, including Malay, to become a foreman on these plantations. Now, during his travels, he encounters many Aboriginal tribes and he studies their witchcraft, their occult behavior, that thing that's outside of Western society, that occult ideal. So he studies all the different things that they do and he realizes this stuff works. This stuff is amazing. So he starts to do all kinds of archaeological digs. Didn't help that he would collected swords and knives from all different periods of of history. He enjoyed archaeological digs for more than one reason. He wanted to know how the people lived and how they were before all these laws were put into place. He wanted to understand why this witchcraft was so scary and what was going on. So he studied it pretty rigorously and after so much work he named himself an archaeologist. <laughs> he was just, he could hold his own amongst the peers in the archaeology groups. So, he gave himself that title, and he wore it with pride. Well, when he comes back, he, he, has, a, he has a problem with illness. He has been kind of sickly most of his life. So when he comes back, and he lives at the Buckingham Palace Flats, he starts to join different occult-type groups to learn more for the more modern, magical, act and practicing, practicing. So he goes to Aleister Crawley. Aleister Crawley was crazy. He was, he was just tired of, of everyone labeling everything. And he was going to shock people into understanding, you cannot dictate what I want to do. And that this is the way we live and the way we live is totally appropriate for us, period. He didn't care what you thought about it. He didn't care what was going on. He was famous for throwing these huge parties where they say, I can't, I can't validate it, but they say that he handed out cocaine, they had wild sexual orgies and all kinds of craziness going down. But for him, first of all, back then, cocaine wasn't like it is today. It wasn't illegal and people knew everybody was going to die off of it. It was a party drug, just like absinthe. So he didn't really, that wasn't like the biggest part of it. And as for the sexual orgies... To him, sex was an expression of joy and sexual desire, an animalistic thing. So, to him, that was not a bad thing. To the rest of the world, an orgy was him and two ladies. Today, that would never fly. That's not an orgy. That's just a threesome. <laughs> but he had his he had his quirks and his his eccentric behavior, so he got along very well with Gerald Gardner, who was also very eccentric. And they worked together. He actually worked under Aleister Crawley. Now, some people will say that he paid Aleister Crawley to give him his initiation. But see, I have a problem with that. Aleister Crawley, he may have been crazy, but he really stood by what he believed. He did not back down from it. So I doubt very seriously that Gerald Gardner and his little sickly self convinced him that he was going to pay him and take the initiation. Not likely. 
Not only that, but when he passed away, the torch was passed to Gerald Gardner to be the head of the OTO, or the Golden Dawn Esoteric Groups. So, he didn't just go in and pay the man. He actually had a relationship with Aleister Crawley and was initiated into the OTO. So much so that he got the torch when Aleister Crawley passed away. Now, when Gerald Gardner was going to come to America and take over for Aleister Crawley, he got very sick and was not able to do so. Again, he struggled with that sickness. So somebody else took the torch and ran with it from there. That left Gerald Gardner still at the Buckingham Flats, and he joined the Freemasons. He liked it because they believed in a creator. They weren't so concerned with who the creator was, and they enjoyed terms like, so mote it be to this day. So he identified with them. He liked that they were a little bit eccentric like he was. And they were very powerful men that had excellent skills. So he joined the Freemasons. Now, when he joined the Freemasons, he came upon this group of men. They were different than most men. First of all, they hung back. They had their opinions, but they were guarded. And they weren't like most folks. They were a bit reserved but eccentric at the same time. So he naturally, like attracts like, was drawn to them. As he gets to know them better, and as they start discussing occult-type issues, he finds out that this is a family of witches. They have been hiding underground for hundreds of years, passing their information down generation to generation. Well, they obviously all like each other. They all become good friends, and the women take to Gerald Gardner because of his kindness, and he is he's so charming. Even though he's sickly, he needs to be nurtured and loved, and as witches, we want to heal and nurture people. So he got a lot of attention, and they taught him all the things they knew, and he eventually earned his initiation into this family of witches. Now, once he discovered what they had, and once he saw the effects it had on himself and all of the things that he encountered, he wanted to tell everybody. He was super excited, but there was a problem. You see, those witches were not about to come out of the closet. There was some major ramifications for them, even though the law was repealed. He was not allowed to say anything regarding them whatsoever because they knew that he would not be losing a job, not able to feed his family, or unable to live in the community. He was Gerald Gardner, but they were the working class man, and they did not want to lose everything they had because people still had a stigma that witches were evil and bad. And so he did not publish anything. Now, he went to work on it, shared it with his friends, but did not publish or make public any of the understandings or knowledge that he gained from the family. And he never betrayed the family. Not once. So, when the elders passed away, the repeal had come out. After they had worked on some things, he took it back and he expressed it to them and he said, I want to publish this book. I'll say nothing about you except for that you're a family. I won't give any indicators that it's you. So that... I can express this because this needs to go out to the world. People need to know this is real and that it is a valid religion that has survived hundreds of years of genocide. So the younger generations decided they believed it to be true too. They were tired of hiding. They were tired of not being able to be who they were and they understood. So they were willing to let him step out on the limb and if any kind of things were coming down the line, it would hit Gerald Gardner first. So they were okay with that because he would protect him and protect them and they trusted him. And he did. He wrote the first book written by a witch called Witchcraft Today and it was published in 1954. Now, Gerald Gardner was not the father of witchcraft. He wasn't the father of Wicca, but he was the father of the reemergence of Wicca in the UK. He took a step, a leap, and stood out in front of everybody and said, I'm a witch, I practice witchcraft, and this is how I do it. And that was very brave. He was a pioneer for witches everywhere to reemerge and to come out of hiding. 
He set the model and the example. And over the years, they watched and they waited. They saw the reaction of the communities and what they thought. And as things began to change, they slowly started coming out again. And that's when you find all of these books being written, all of these families starting to practice openly again. And here we are today, alive, well, and out in the open. So he had a big role to play. Now, after Gerald Gardner comes another very important man, and his name is Raymond Buckland. Now, in 1963, he introduces witchcraft to America. He actually opens the first coven in America. Now, we're in America. <laughs> we may not have a law against it, but boy, we can treat you like crap if we don't like it. So, it was a hard road for this poor man. But you know what? He stood his ground. He learned from Gardner the very best there was not to back down. And his ideas began to spread across America. And he utilized people like Gerald Gardner and Aleister Crawley and all the different people who had come before him to say, we're valid, we're here, and this is real, and I'll teach you how. And as it began to work for other people, they began to desire to start their own covens. So Raymond Buckland went to work, published many wonderful books on how to be a witch. He even published one that is my favorite called Wicca for Life. It is about generational witchcraft from birth to the Summerland and beyond, and it is an amazing book. And I utilize it for a lot of things because his ideas are so good. That's the thing about Wicca. It is new because we have so many gaps from where we lost things within the years of the Inquisitions and all the burning and all that because they didn't just come into a village and say, take the man and put him in jail. They found out the father was a witch, the children, the animals, the house, the books, everything inside of it was burned. So Wiccan communities lost whole families. And if you know anything about witches, we all have our special gift. We all know our special craft. And that was an issue because it caused gaps in our, in our religion. We could not fill them because there was no one there left. They were gone. So we had to go with what we did, what we did know. Now today we're starting to fill those gaps in as more Wiccans study and more Wiccans meditate and look into it and research. And as the information age grows and we can collect more validated data, we actually are able to put together a much better compilation of all these things. Well, you never guess what happened. America took this and ran with it. And in 1974, the American Council of Witches headed by Carl Llewellyn Winsk of Llewellyn Publishing, went to work developing the 13 principles of belief. These 13 principles of belief gave our religion validity. No more could you say we weren't a valid religion because we had our tenets. And these witches came from all walks of life. They were not all Gardarian, Alexandrian, Teutonic, Strega, Generational. They were all different kinds, Shaman, shamans and, and um, fairy witchcraft. They all came together and they created these 13 principles that they believe crossed over their differences. Remember, witches were tolerant. Differences are, in, are a part of our everyday life. We believe that the soul is a unique being. So it has specific lessons to learn and ways of assimilating the world around it. So we don't expect us all to be exactly alike. We are not creating robots. We are creating people. We're not even creating. People are creating their own worldviews and their own ideas. And so these 13 principles of belief actually did a lot for our religion. And that's why I respect Carl Llewellyn Wentz so much and why I buy so much stuff from Llewellyn Publishing. It is because... This was a huge step, and these witches came out of their shells to come together to help us establish validity within the United States of America. And because of that, we now have military members who have chaplains who are Wiccans. They can put the, the star, the pinnacle, on their gravesite and on their dog tags. They can utilize religious freedom so that they can practice their religious beliefs under the full moon. They're allowed to go out and do that. 
Not to mention now our prison systems have Wiccan ideas and thoughts that are allowed to be given to the prisoners within those systems. So we're moving into lots of public places because we now have that freedom to be a valid religion. Not to mention we have lots of places that are coming up that are supporting witches everywhere because we're just like everyone else. We struggle. We're hungry. We want work. We want things to, to help us to get better. Our children get cancer. We see the things that are ugly in this world just like everyone else. And that's why we come together to support one another. And witches are very community-minded. So this principle that was started by that 13 principles of belief actually carried us into a new rage where we could communicate openly and under freedom of religion. That's why I'm ordained as a Wiccan high priestess because I wanted to prove my worth within the Wiccan community to those outside of it. Not necessarily the witches themselves, because my acts and my words will speak for themselves. We believe what you do speaks louder than what you have. So, I don't believe that that's a necessity within our community, but in order for people outside the community to allow me to do certain things, I have to have that, like legal hand fastings, being able to um, stand up for children who are Wiccan within the foster care system, and many other things that I would not be able to do if they didn't request a Wiccan high priestess that's ordained. So, legally, we're able to stand our ground too. And that's all because these, these group of, of witches from all different watch, walks of life helped us develop something we can all stand for. And that's why at the Family Wicca, we stand beside our brothers and sisters in witchcraft all over the world, and we stand beside those 13 principles of belief. That's also why we call ourselves Wiccan, because that is what we stand for, and we want to be identified with those of similar belief. Witchcraft, Wicca, in the history of it, it doesn't really make a difference. What you call yourself is a communication of what you believe yourself to be. So that brings us to your most current date. Here we are, living out in the open, and now teaching out in the open. And that is a miracle in and of itself. Now that was a quick overview of everything that we believe as Wiccans, but... That is the basic gist of our history. There are many, many more things I could go into. The Salem Witch Trials, um, all the different things that happened during the burning times, all the different villages that were burned, how some people scope it to, from hundreds of thousands to millions of people who were burned for absolutely no reason other than people for political gain. We could go into a whole lot of other stuff, but that is for another time. For now, you understand the basic parts of witchcraft, where it comes from starting at the Paleolithic age all the way to where we are now. So now that you know that, let me put your hands on some books that will actually be excellent for your foundation. I call them foundational authors and foundational books. I believe that they're things that you should read. And I don't believe with everything within those books. But the spirit and the essence, the concepts are all there. And they're just expressed in different ways. And a witch is nothing if they don't expose themselves to many different ideas so that they can create the life and the religion and the spiritual guidance that they feel is best for them as a unique individual. So, let's go ahead and go over some of those books and some of those authors. First, I would tell you to read Margaret Murray's um, The Witch Cult in Western Europe. Because this was the idea people had of witches before witches told them what we truly were. So, I read it sometimes and I laugh. Because <laughs> I think, really? You know, that's... I mean, where did that come from? But that was the best evidence that she had at the time. So it's kind of cool to see what people thought before we were able to actually step out and say, let me express to you what we really do. The next one would be Aradia, the Gospel of the Witches, and that's by um, Charles Godfrey Leland. He wrote, uh, he put together a bunch of stories that he collected from the Strega in Tuscany, and then he created 
that particular guide. And Doreen Valiente actually uses some of the words straight from the Strega themselves in her books and in her writings. So it's good to find out where did that stuff come from? Well, it came from the Strega, and Charles is the one who wrote about it. Then I would tell you to move into Aleister Crawley. Now, I realize people are not real crazy about Aleister Crawley, but the truth is he had some very valid points and very good ideas about life. And it's also important to know who he was because he is a huge historical figure in the Wiccan community. And though he is somebody that people are going to base a lot of their ideas on. So it's good for you to know who he is. And he has a, a lot of books. I've probably read most of them. There are some I haven't, but he has quite a few. But the Book of Law is a good one to start with. It's small. It kind of gives you an idea. And it tells you why he says, do what thy wilt is the whole of the law. Of course, under love. But that's why he says it. It's a little red book. And it's really good. And I read it every couple of years just to refresh my memory of what he had to say. Then he also has many other books that you can go and look up. And again, that's Aleister Crawley. Next, I would point you to Gerald Gardner. You see, Gerald Gardner was the first witch to actually write a book about witchcraft in his Witchcraft Today. He also has another book out and a couple of books that are non that are fictional books, not non-fictional, that are fictional books that he wrote before he actually started writing about truth, the truth about witchcraft. So I would point you in that direction. Next, I would move you to Raymond Buckland because, well, he is an excellent balance. He brings it into an American perspective, and he has a lot of amazing ideas and thoughts on witchcraft and how to pass it down generationally or how to practice it as a solitaire. He also writes on gypsy magic. He, anything he comes into contact with, he assimilates it, and he teaches it, and he's an excellent teacher. So I would suggest reading any of his books, and he even has a video that that goes with his Blue Book series, um, his um, Complete Book of Witchcraft. Uh, this is the book, and he actually has a video that looks just like this, and you can get that from your occult stores. Then I would have to say to move into The Spiral Dance by Starhawk. Her ideas and points of view are just really good. And the way that she writes really breaks things down in a manner that's easy to understand. So she's a very good author. The book has, is world renowned for a good reason. So I would suggest getting your hands on that book. The next one would be Drawing Down the Moon by Margaret Adler. Now, remember, that's how witches charge. We draw the energy down from the moon. So it would be a good book for you to read for reference purposes. It also is a good book just because it's written by a witch. So make sure that you try to get your hands on that. It has been spread around the Wiccan community, and it's a popular book. So it obviously has something that people can actually draw from. Next, I would move you to Scott Cunningham. Anything Scott Cunningham but particularly his Solitary Wicca series. He has Wicca for the Solitary Practitioner. Living Wicca is the second book. Both very good. And our family actually utilizes his book of, his, um, book of herbs, his Encyclopedia of Herbs, for all the things that we like to do because he, is a lot, he has a lot more knowledge and understanding of herbs than we do. And because I've watched his video, he also has a video out about herbal magic and herbs, I trust him. So he is somebody that I've chosen to go to for guidance on herbal issues. So I would suggest going to him for that too. He also has magical housekeeping and lots of other stuff that are really wonderful that can help move you in the right direction. I believe he also does some other stuff like Raymond Buckland with the candle magic and the gypsy magic, etc. Scott Cunningham's books should be on your shelf because it really is good and helps break it down so that you can work witchcraft by yourself. Then I would point you to The Modern Magic by Donald Michael Craig. Now Donald Michael Craig's magical practice is esoteric in, in, its, in its concept. He is part of that Aleister Crawley, Golden Dawn, esoteric magic group of the Ciceros and Israel Regarde. And though Israel Regarde is a good writer, and so are the Ciceros, 
Donald Michael Craig is more modern and he's able to bring those ideas into a manner that it's easier to understand. And he just revised his book not too long ago, a couple years ago, to include some more stuff like chaos magic. So he's a good one, especially for keeping good um, journals, good record keeping, and the tarot. He works a lot with it. Um, so that would be who I would suggest to turn you to turn you towards if you want to learn more about that particular kind of magic. And then we're going to wrap up those foundational books with someone that is very controversial and a lot of witches do not like her. But I like her because of her ability to cross the boundaries from her where she came from as a Christian into her ideas as a witch and that's Silver Raven Wolf. Silver Raven Wolf did a lot of research. She studied under many, many witches, and she learned her craft well, well enough to have be a queen in witchcraft, meaning she has many covens underneath her. She's actually the queen of the Black Forest Clan. She is very particular in her ideas and thoughts that I'm not really that particular about. I tend to stay away from angels and things of that nature, but that's just my thought process. That's how I am. That doesn't mean that everyone has to be that way. But if you're coming from a Christian point of view, she does a really good job of bridging that, that gap. But she also introduced Wicca to a whole new generation of witches, the teen witch. It was very popular, and teens everywhere fell in love with the teen witch and what it had to say because it related to who they were. So, if you have a teenager, maybe you want to grab that book, or if you were like me, I just wanted to read to see what she had to say, grab that book because it is a book that is influential within the teen community when it comes to witchcraft. Okay. Well, that's all I have to tell you today about the history of witchcraft and those foundational authors I think are important, but there are many, many other subjects that we are going to cover, and I'm going to talk more about that history as we go through it because I believe that history is an important part of everything. We're going to talk about it through our tool studies, through our 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 studies of elements. I mean, there's, there's histories in everything, so we'll be discussing a lot more on the history of witchcraft. Just for now, I wanted you to understand how we progressed as a society to come to where we all are today, free and able to talk about the things that we care about. So, if you are taking this class, then you should be going to week two on our website. And remember that this week you will be submitting to me the History of Witchcraft Worksheet. Please fill it out and submit it so it can be graded to make sure that you are on track, that you understand who these people are, what they did, and how it affected the world of witchcraft, including things like the Malus Maleficarum. I don't think I've ever been in more shock than when I was on a pagan or on a witchcraft site that was a community and no one in the community knew what the Malus Maleficarum was. I, I was in utter shock. I mean, this was this was a huge thing in the Wiccan community. So Make sure that you keep up with what is historical. Take the time to research it. I tell people no matter what club, association, religion that you're going to join, know its history. Know what happened and can you stand by it? Can it be something that you can say, I, I'm okay with this? And keep in mind that every religion has its positive and its negative people in it. There are people that bring out the very best in Wicca and people who bring out the very worst in it. Same thing with Christianity, with the Muslims, with Hindus, with Tibetans even. There are those who bring out the very best in every religion and those who bring out the very worst. Irregardless, they are valid and they are necessary in understanding the history and how it all went down. Were there witches out there that were bad? Absolutely. How do I say they're bad? Because I really think good and bad are subjective. I, I don't really believe that you can have a definition that defines all things good and defines all things bad. But when you're harming people on purpose for your own gain, that rubs me a little wrong and probably all the people around you wrong. <laughs> so you might not want to do that. <laughs> But they're out there, so you will read stories of witches that did some horrible things. But I can give you stories of every other person in every other kind of religion that did some horrible things. It doesn't remove our validity, and it doesn't make us all evil. 
It just means that we've had people that have stood out. But that's how powerful a witch can be. They can be so powerful that an entire world makes a law saying they do not want to see people practicing witchcraft because they are that afraid of their influence and their ability to make things happen. So stick that in your book of shadows and understand you have that potential too. You have to guard yourself, keep yourself safe, keep your mind flowing right there. So many times I want to do something ugly to people and you have to correct yourself and say no because I know what will happen if I do that. And we're going to discuss some of the important documents within the Wiccan community. So don't worry. We'll talk about those things too. Just be patient. It's all coming. This week, get that working book of shadows out and make a section and call it history. And as we go through all these documents and as we go through historical facts, you can place those within your history working book of shadows section. So do your homework. Don't forget to post on week two's forum. And make your new section and start discovering the history of witchcraft. Until I see you next video, blessed be.